What's up, everybody? Welcome to the newest episode of Demo Day, the podcast for entrepreneurs and venture capitalists where we demystify the culture of joining one of the top accelerator, incubator, or VC programs from around the world. I'm your host, Sean Goldfaden, CEO of Coefficient Labs. And on today's episode, we'll be interviewing Lucas Poles, managing partner of Amplight Ventures. Amplight's goal as a fund is to move the needle on founder failure and aim their program at breaking down the barriers faced by entrepreneurs trying to navigate the startup world. Lucas takes us on his journey as a founder, gives us his best advice for students coming out of college and what it takes to be a great venture capitalist. On today's show, we cover the keys to a successful business partnership, why it's absolutely essential to develop not only your network, but the tools that you use, and why personal reflection is the number one trait for founders and entrepreneurs. Lucas comes to us having sat on both sides of the table, both as an investor and an entrepreneur. And on this episode, he'll be teaching entrepreneurs what they can learn from investors and vice versa. Also, we have a major, major announcement. Coefficient Labs will be giving away a $10,000 growth hacking package to one VC and one founder that leaves both a rating and a review on the Apple podcast. So if you're watching this podcast on video or listening to it as a podcast, please go to the Apple podcast, leave a rating and a review. And at the end of season one, Coefficient Labs will choose two lucky raters and reviewers to get a $10,000 growth hacking package. Without further ado, let's get into demo day. Lucas, thank you so, so much for joining us today on Demo Day. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Awesome. So before we dive too deep into your early life and your VC life and what you're doing right now, um, on the last podcast that I listened to, so much of your vibe is centered around uh, moving the needle for founder failure and really trying to bridge the gap and uh, helping startups really understand the fundamentals. I wanted to start by understanding why is it so important for you to help startups uh, avoid failure? That was a good question. Um, I would honestly say, so my big target has always been uh, around climate change. So uh, when I look at the ecosystem, I look at the different problems that are in the world, a lot of them are considered wicked problems. And so uh, what a wicked problem is, is like something like homelessness. There's no like silver bullet associated with each. and so. When I started reviewing all of the, the different challenges that we have in the different sectors, uh, my thought was like, okay, well, how do you how do you step back and how do you address the whole ecosystem? And it's literally by helping the founders who can make those impacts in the different spaces uh, to be able to to make change in the world. So my goal has always been to help assist them so that they can take the next step forward uh, and actually do what they need to and change the world. Is this something that you've always been passionate about since you were a, you know, a youngster? Walk us a little bit through, like, where did you grow up? Were you from Los Angeles or did you end up moving to the LA ecosystem? No, yeah, from LA. Um, I'm one of the few, uh, surprisingly. <laughs> it's quite funny. Uh, I remember the first time someone told me the term like Silicon Beach, like, I don't know, 2012, 2013. I'm like, what are you even talking about? Like, <laughs> So, I mean, I've been here uh, my entire life, so I've been able to watch the uh, the transition, but... Um, yeah. What the, town did you grow up in? Santa Monica. Gr oh, so really, really yeah. local here. Oh yeah. Like, <laughs> like in it, in it, like I'm, I am Silicon Beach. Okay. You know, most people are like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm from Manhattan Beach. They're like, oh, that's not really LA. And they're like, or you're like from LA and you're like, uh, really? Yeah. But Santa Monica is, is the heart of Silicon Beach. Uh, did you, uh, what were you like growing up? Like how would your friends or your teachers describe you kind of elementary middle school? Pain in the ass, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was not a huge fan of uh, the learning the, the school system just because I, I would get very bored in class. And so I got in trouble a lot. So mm -hmm. I'd finish my assignment like in five or ten getting minutes. Getting red cards, getting like the red cards. Oh, my God. I had more parent-teacher conferences than I can even count. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to throw a curveball question in here, which is, 
what what advice do you have now? You know, uh, in your thirties, you've been through the system, or at least uh, you've you've been through enough experience. What advice do you have for parents that have kids that are in that elementary, middle school, and maybe aren't built for that sort of system? I mean, everything in education is moving so quickly now. Um, you know, how would you give advice to parents that maybe their kid isn't uh, built for the history classes and the science, but are are more focused on their pa- uh, passions or their hobbies? I think a question. My nephews, so I have twin nephews. Um, one of them has a similar personality that I did, especially back then. What they've done is moved more into uh, at magnet schools now. They have the ability to keep going uh, past their whatever their grade level is. So if they're done with uh, third grade math but and they want to move on to fourth grade, like they're not stopped, and so they have the ability to keep going. So um, addressing, finding the right fit is really a, a big deal for what they're looking for. And then extracurricular activities, um, keeping them busy, keeping them excited about different things and letting them work on their passion projects uh, going forward. How do you see uh, school changing over, you know, I'm, um, thinking in the next couple of years about having children, my wife and I were talking about like, what would the future look like in school? You know, is there still going to be high school? If, if, if our kids are going to high school, it's 12 years, 13 years down the road from now. And you, I just start thinking like, is this, is the school system still in 12 years going to be built around what it was 10, 15 years ago? Or are there going to be more of whether it be like you're explaining around magnet schools or, um, schools that are more focused on certain vocations, whether it's, you know, coding or, uh, you know, software or sales or whatever that might be, do you envision um, school uh, changing for that high school kind of early college in the next 10 years? Yeah, I mean, I could see a a definite shift. I mean, at USC, they have the the Iovine Academy, um, and I really, really like their model um, from an entrepreneurship standpoint of the, they go to school, they, it's not about GE classes, it's about like, hey, let's build a business, let's figure out how to get there. Um, and let me give you the resources to explore and to learn. Um, we interviewed uh, this really fascinating woman from USC's Jimmy Iovine School, and she was walking me through her thesis. And uh, her project was to plot on a graph something that you normally wouldn't be able to plot. And so she explains to me that like, she essentially plots out a, a relationship between two people and that basically these two people start as points on the graph exactly in the same position with different character attributes giving them some sort of weights and then bam they meet each other and the linear uh, graph starts to move right and like as they have these experiences together traveling kissing it starts to work in these positive negative flows and then something happens you get into the fight and you can and I was like Wow, like this is clearly, at least it felt, you know, uh, if she's watching, you know, uh, it felt as though she was referring to almost a a personal experience. But what I found super fascinating was what would it look like if you applied it to families or uh, husband and wives that have stayed together for 30, 40, 50 years or partners even in business that are, you know, like Warren Buffett and uh, what do relationships look like and those that really make it? So I guess I'll turn into a question. When you uh, look at founders that have been through multiple ventures together or have experienced multiple ups and downs, what do you think it is that keeps them together in the long term? Oh, that is a that is a loaded question. Um, well, let me think about it. What keeps Abe and I together? Um, very open communication. We don't let anything sit. Uh, we don't push anything under the rug. We have tough conversations early so that they don't become significantly larger like uh, th- there's no ever anger or animosity towards uh, either of us if one of us has a challenge on something we communicate it in a very respectful like open way um, I think that's for I mean me and my co-founder that's probably the biggest uh, yeah that's probably the biggest thing for for us is yeah open openness and trust and I think like a lot of the people listening to this show are freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors in college or just out of school. Um, and I, what I've learned and have had conversations with my own team that are on the younger side uh, and in just getting out is that uh, we call it the 24 hour rule, which is like whether it's a relationship at home with friends or family or coworkers, or your boss, like if you have something on your mind, you got 24 hours to get it off. Like this is the open space. But if it is lingering for weeks, two weeks, that's on you. And like, I think that for, you know, a lot of the younger founders, 
you have to overvalue communication because uh, sometimes it feels awkward to have those conversations, especially if you're not experienced in it. But open communication, you know, you're hearing it now from Lucas, who's had a, how many years have you had your partner? Two. Two. Yeah. 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 Yeah, a little so, bit longer. You know, making it making it through the hard times and the good times uh, requires you know really candid openness. Um, what did you do for fun as a kid? So you know, you grew up in Santa Monica. You were a pain in the ass to your teachers. <laughs> um, did you always have sort of an affinity towards business, or did you uh, sort of uh, get introduced to business once you first got into college? Uh, all right, so that's. Two different questions. The business piece. No, I didn't really get into business, uh, like the idea around it until college. So my big focus, and even when I first started at college, my big focus was environmental studies. So I went to Santa Cruz to uh, uh, really learn. Uh, They had a great uh, environmental studies program. So I went there for that initially. Got brainwashed into doing accounting, (laughs) which was, I I hate auditing. but uh, was it driven by just like um, accountants made more money or uh, your parent? that's what your parents did? Or how did you get into no, it? I had a great teacher um, who taught a lot of the accounting classes and he was just, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think from that standpoint, he really enjoyed it. And I think I would have liked tax a lot better than audit, but um, I loved learning uh, accounting to understand the backbone of the business and really understand the numbers and look at a balance sheet and understand what it says. Uh, but auditing and practice is I'm tying work papers together all day. Like it, 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 this number matches this number and this number matches that number and uh, a monkey could have done my no job. No creativity. No, God. <laughs> so it was not the right space uh, for me to be in. But no, when I uh, – yeah, uh, environmental AP uh, AP environmental science really impacted uh, my life a lot from that standpoint. That's where I start learning about all this and the challenges that we had had and learned this what almost 15, 20 years ago. Um, so it's fortunate that we're slowly starting to wake up to it. Um, when you say wake up to it, just I want to make sure I understand what what are we waking up to? That we're dying as a species. Mm. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it, it's frank, but it's true. I mean, we are, where do you see the, the most problematic areas or like where the most front of mind for you? The, uh, global warming, uh, what climate change. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're in an oven. We are cooking ourselves and we cannot stop. And we have what, eight years, 12 before, uh, we hit a threshold where we almost can't come back. Um, so yeah, that's my. Yeah, I don't know. What's really important to you right now? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're uh, uh, the vision that I see if we don't change is the, the degradation of society. I mean, it, uh, the structure that we have now is very fragile. We could easily fall back into uh, absolute chaos. And so uh, when resources are scarce and you have to fight your neighbor for water, like that's a scary world. <laughs> I've been joking around that I'm going to start collecting bottles of water in Palm <laughs> Desert and everyone's like, dude, bottled water is, and I'm like, yeah, well, in the like apocalypse, like I'm going to have bottled water in Palm Desert and you're not. <laughs> um, once you got out of uh, UC Santa Cruz, were you always a photographer or did that sort of come through being more like attuned to the environment and, and where did photography play a role in your career, life, happiness? Uh, it was a creative outlet for, because I was at ADP for a long time, so it was, uh, it was a creative outlet. My dad had actually done a lot of traveling, and he started, I mean, honestly, photography, art is in my family deep. Like, my both my grandparents were painters. My mom was a painter. My sister went to Brooks and did photography. So it was a little bit odd that it had, I had not picked it up earlier. Um, and my dad had done a bunch of travel photography and traveling around. And uh, one day I just ended up picking up a camera and started having a lot of fun doing it and uh, kept, uh, kept going from there. Um, yeah, did it professionally uh, briefly. It's an interesting industry, the entertainment scene. Um, but yeah, had a good time. Now, just before around like 2017 or just before that, you decided to go and get your master's or, or you were thinking about uh, going either accounting or business and then at the very last minute decided that you wanted to switch and go to get an MS in entrepreneurship. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, I was going to get an MBA, but it's because uh, 
so USC had always had the, and because I'm from LA, both my grandparents went to USC, so it had been a family for a while too. Um, they had been known as like the entrepreneurship school. And so um, I knew I wanted to get into entrepreneurship and I wanted to get a higher uh, level degree to be able to accomplish that because I felt like I was missing a couple of the tools in my tool belt. Um, but uh, I was literally going to go take the GMAT and uh, I was fortunate that I found the specialty masters section uh, on their site and found out about the uh, the masters in entrepreneurship, which uh, to me is awesome because I got to skip the first year of the MBA and just go straight into entrepreneurship. When y- you said something about um, just a minute ago around um, not feeling like you have the tools in your tool belt, and I think that like there's so many of these online, especially in the marketing world, you know, we run Facebook ads and Instagram ads for teams and there's so many of these online courses and it's almost like, I don't know, I was talking earlier and it's this like in law school, sometimes they say like, you just learn how to learn, that you, you're not actually going and getting practice and that a lot of these entrepreneurs feel like if I just go to entrepreneurship school or if I just go to business school, like then I'm gonna have the tools I need. Now that you've gone through it, you've worked an entrepreneur, you've been an entrepreneur, you help thousands of entrepreneurs. Do you still believe that you didn't have the tools at the time or did it uh, in any sort of way sort of um, kind of take away from your a couple of years where you could have been doing something else? No, it reaffirmed that I did not have the, uh, the tools uh, necessary. So I think one of the most important parts uh, of an entrepreneur is the network. And that was another reason why I ended up going back to USC was uh, to get the network that I needed because from my perspective, I was coming from uh, do, consulting uh, small businesses on the lifestyle side of uh, the equation. And so I literally had to stop that network and restart from scratch an entirely new network. And I think the degree and being able to network with the right people there um, helped my trajectory tremendously going forward. Why do you think, because I think, I think that there's, especially with schools like USC, Princeton, Stanford, they're spending so much uh, money and resources in computer science and engineers. And whether it's a, um, like a stereotype that engineers aren't social or they're not able to communicate, why for those that aren't and those that are like, no, I'm just a coder and I don't need a network, why is having a network so important when you're an early stage entrepreneur? Uh, you have people to lean on to uh, to get better. I mean, it's, it's almost impossible to execute entirely by yourself on any idea or any venture that you have. And so by finding, uh, if you're the CEO of a company, I mean, you have three jobs. It's recruit, uh, sell, and... Keep money in the bank. <laughs> <laughs> um, sure. <laughs> Um, and so a lot of that comes down to, to your, a lot of it is network driven. And so if you need to find the right talent, you need to find the right resources, you can lean on people to be able to get that accomplished going forward. You hit a roadblock, you can ask for help. Whereas if you don't want a network, you hit a roadblock, it's done. Um, and so to me, the network is one of the most undervalued aspects uh, of an entrepreneur. I was having this conversation with one of our team members where he was like, we were all sitting at the table, some some youngsters in there, and uh, Ian was essentially saying that like, he's been going through these mental models where like, if every day he learns like a new tool or like one new tool that by the time, you know, a year goes by, he'll have all of this knowledge of all these tools. And I said, I'm gonna give you like the best piece of advice if you took that exact same time, like all the time you're learning these new tools and and you applied it towards every day reaching out to one of your high school buddies, one of your old professors, one of your old mentors, and you put that same, I promise you that you're compounded, whatever you're hoping to achieve, do you agree with um, the investment on people over tools and technology or do you think that there's a balance that needs to be attained in today's world? Uh, Honestly, I think you need a balance. So like even... Like if I take a vacation now, like I bring probably seven books with me to just power through while I'm there because uh, the number is great, but you also, I mean, you have to continuously keep learning. And if you're not, you're falling behind. Um, Some young up and strapping uh, person that wants to work harder than you. And so uh, I think it's critical that you do end up working both and uh, they're both. hyper useful, but it also depends on which part of your venture uh, that you're in. Are you, if you're at launch, maybe tools are significantly more 
uh, useful for you at the beginning because uh, you're trying to figure out what product market fit is and, and do everything else. Whereas if you're raising, call it a seed round, like your network is going to be vastly more important because you need capital going forward and you need to be able to tap other people that you've spent time with uh, to be able to achieve that goal. Uh, you're a freshman or a sophomore now and you're trying to decide you're in the same exact position that Lucas was in where you are thinking to yourself, like, should I get an MBA or should I go and become an entrepreneur? Do you, so a couple questions and you can probably tell I'm loading lots of these questions in the same, same question. <laughs> do you believe that everyone can be an entrepreneur or do you think that there is a place for entrepreneurs and a place for those that should go and learn other, uh, business practices? Uh, I do not think that everyone can be an entrepreneur. Like this is a, uh, it has been, I don't know, romanticized. Romanticized, yes, yeah, that's like, exactly the word. That's exactly the word I was thinking. Um, uh, they only see, a lot of time, entrepreneurs only see the wins. They don't see the, the entrepreneurs that like, when you are crushed, crying on the shower floor because you feel like the world is ending because your venture has basically died. Um, so no, I don't think that everyone uh, everyone can actually do this. Um, my path is a lot different from a lot of other entrepreneurs and uh, it's odd, but I, I wouldn't change the way that I went. So even when I got out of uh, undergrad, like I went and worked for a big company. Um, I did it for a long time because it gave me the ability to, to not only learn the structure of like a Fortune 500, but it gave me the ability to find different skills that uh, and different mentors there that I would not otherwise have access to if I was just doing it as an entrepreneur and trying to figure it out. Um, so for me, it's a little bit different. I guess my view is a lot different. Like I will never tell you to drop out of undergrad uh, to to start a venture. Like I think that's crazy, and us basing our entire industry off of. Snapchat or Facebook, I think, is a huge detriment to what we stand for. Um, do you think it's because the ideas aren't there? Do you think it's because the execution's not there? Or a third option, do you think it's because of the people management? That's the thing that I've been most interested in is going from, you know, a two-person team to a four-person to a 10 to a 12 and how, like, you you have to be a different leader at different stages of yeah. the business. Uh, I think the, the talent management... Uh, the talent management is a is a big deal. Um, I know that I struggled when I first transitioned from sales into leadership. Um, I struggled a lot. I struggled with emotional intelligence, with empathy, and uh, I had to uh, be very disciplined and reflective uh, to be able to learn and be conscious of those weakness weaknesses so that uh, I could execute going forward. Um, if I was doing it as an entrepreneur. I wouldn't have time to be able to do that, which means that like there's you, a lot of time you don't have time to reflect. And so I don't know if I'd be able to execute as effectively if I hadn't gone through that training and that understanding and I've done it before. When did you decide that you were going to start Spark, your first company, right? Is Spark your first? So yeah. when well, was... Yeah, yeah. Ish. We'll yeah, yes. it's like, <laughs> yeah, we'll everyone has yeah. a couple in the in the in the battleground uh, that never quite made the light of day. Uh, but but Spark was really your first major go at it, and and what seemed to be the spark of uh, the spark of your uh, VC career. Uh, bring us through the early days of Spark. What was the problem you were trying to solve? And uh, in general, you know, talk to us just about what it was like in those first couple of months. What was that problem I was trying to solve? Oh, uh, the problem at universities, uh, disciplines at universities don't talk to each other. And so if you're someone who's starting a company and you're trying to recruit from, if you're a business dude trying to recruit from an engineering school, like they have put up barriers so that you can basically not do it. Mm. Um, and so the goal was to, to work around that and figure out a way so that people could execute within universities to actually achieve uh, what they were looking to do because homogenous teams is what we traditionally end up with if that doesn't happen and that's an absolute train wreck. Um, so that's where we started. Uh, I don't think there, the trying to connect the different disciplines was an absolute disaster. 
Because uh, like Spark, <laughs> Spark basically was connecting. You have your accelerators and incubators. You have a recruiting, and then you have these sort of like startup competitions. Uh, competition seems to be kind of like something that's really close to your heart. And I know you're a competitive person. Um, why competitions, and why you know why is this a focus of yours? Uh, we did competitions to get around uh, the fact. So trying to work with universities was too much of a train wreck to try to accomplish. So the way that we figured out how to get access to the talent. Uh, uh, of the entrepreneurs at the universities without having to deal with the entrepreneur with that with the universities is by uh, providing the software for them to be able to run their competitions because the 95 percent of the people that enter into these competitions don't actually end up creating a venture but it creates a great talent pool for people who are uh, interested in entrepreneurship so that was our actual thought behind uh behind that and did you uh throughout Spark itself, did you always know that you wanted to move into VC or was that something that happened later on? Uh, at what point did you transition from being an entrepreneur into investing in companies and being a part of their growth? I had always thought that I was going to move into VC much later in my career, but I kind of, I mean, the same way that everyone else does, I kind of fell into venture capital and I figured that it could help uh, continue to develop the network that I'd already started when I jumped in. So, um, yeah, I mean, I was with Quake for, what, a year, year and a half? Um, helped them launch LA. So, no, I feel, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was good. For other founders or students that are currently thinking about working in VC or joining an accelerator, uh, what words of wisdom or words of caution do you have? Um, what I seem to have learned um, is that for a lot of the younger you know, just out of school, the idea of working for a big VC fund is like, oh my gosh, it's the coolest thing. Uh, is it really like that in your opinion or, um, you know, shed some light into what it's like or life is like in a VC fund? I don't know. I had a good time. Uh, I mean, I had a good time doing it, but I, I mean, I have a passion for helping founders. So, I mean, working in the accelerator was, uh, to me, great. I mean, I even advised a couple of the companies from the last one now, um, so, yeah, I mean, you, you'll have a good you'll have a good time. It's a great learning experience uh, from that perspective. It can accelerate your understanding of entrepreneurship significantly because I think I looked at like 3000 pitch decks last year, um, which is just it's a ludicrous amount of data. But uh, by seeing that many decks, like I can identify what is wrong and what an investor is not going to like within 15 seconds of looking at your deck, mm -hmm. which to me is like a super valuable skill um, that I would not have had uh, without diving into that space. I want to kind of transition us over to demo days. Uh, this podcast is called Demo Day because I think there are a lot of people that are um, entrepreneurs thinking of entering into a program, whether it's Quake or Amplify or Mucker. Um, in your opinion, are demo days more for the VC or more for the founder? And what are the dynamics of a demo day for those that haven't been? <laughs> Um, dynamics is they get up, uh, pitch for generally anywhere from three to five minutes. Uh, they have a booth after to connect with people and network. Um, it's a culmination of kind of the work that they put in for the last 10 to 16 weeks. Um, who is it more for? I honestly think it's more for the founders than, uh, for the VCs because like as a VC, like, uh, I don't really want to go to demo days. Um, I'd rather just have coffee with you uh, one off um, going forward. That's what I was curious about because it's a, it's sort of um, like the the VC pitch is evolving so much because it, it really started as, you know, Sand Hill Road. Like you go and you've got to set up these. It's all through intro. Now you have a little bit more infrequent coffee meetings. Then you have demo days, which are like, oh, I don't have to meet with all these people. I can just go one time. And now there's sort of like these – VC 2.0, 3.0, which is like scalable, where it's not really in an in-person meeting, but there's an online forum and component. Yeah. Or there's like the podcast, the pitch, where they have people going on. Um, so, you know, what in your POV or, or what should Demo Day be about? Uh, I don't know, from an accelerator perspective? From an accelerator perspective for Demo Day, I think one of the true drivers of Demo Day for them is that uh, it puts a, kind of a time limit or it, it puts a goal uh, there for you to be able to reach so that you push a little bit harder. Um, 
So do you believe in it? I I, I think yeah. I do believe in it. That that having having that uh, time crunch. Yeah. You've you've seen that in the companies you've worked oh, yeah. with. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, they do. You have to shift faster. Um, uh, I like it too because I mean, you get to work one on one. Like I mean, I was working with the founders to craft their pitch like we for seven weeks we would go back and forth um to adjust small things and and see what we need to change and how to actually convey the message that they were trying to get across so yeah. i think it was like seeing that process at mucker lab had such uh, you know i was with insta canvas um which now 2020 and just seeing how they ran that program had a lot to do with how coefficient labs is run we only do these 90 day sprints so it feels everyone on the team is like we have to really think and, and, and act accordingly. And once we get through that process, we switch a new goalpost and go in. And I think that having these shorter sprints um, is something that is very impactful. Again, for anyone that's on uh, the early stage, if you've never picked up the book, uh, Lean Startup by Eric Reese, I don't know if you have any other recommendations, Lucas, but that's certainly a book to help you think about a framework on weekly sprints. Uh, there's another book called uh, Sprint in general. Um, anything anything you've read that you think is good for um, thinking about product development or, mm, product or leadership, yeah. Oh, God, I don't remember. Neil... Neil Patel? Yeah. I think he has a book that I really liked. I don't remember the name of it, though. It's totally blanking on it. It's blanking on me as well. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I would... Neil, if you're listening, we're, we're sorry, man. Huge, huge plug. Really don't remember like, your book. Really liked it, though. We will leave it in the show notes. I did. <laughs> and if you didn't write a book, then got to everyone else, we are sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so what is scalable? Um, you know, this popped up uh, on my LinkedIn feed. Uh, you know, it's, <laughs> I've, I, uh, I got the pitch from, from, uh, from the team. And so uh, what are you trying to get accomplished with scalable and, and what's the goal and, you know, what does success look like? Uh, hmm. What does success look like? So I guess, let's back up. I guess let's start with uh, what the goal is. So um, West Coast Challenge was the first kind of iteration of this. It was an in-person event with a focus to move the needle on founder failure. And so I threw that what, five months ago. Um, and what happened during West Coast Challenge was that we had, I don't know, a thousand entrepreneurs apply um, to come in. And the, we had a bunch of people that wanted to attend, but uh, I had people from like Spain and, uh, and Boulder, Colorado that uh, they flew in. I told the people from Spain, don't fly in for a startup event like that. It's ridiculous. Um, but so my goal was that with Scalable was to try to uh, recapture what we did with West Coast Challenge, but to level the playing field for everyone so that uh, – if you don't have the means to be able to to actually make it to LA to an actual event, it's like, hey, why don't we just do this online? Uh, where it's 2019, we should be able to figure this out. Um, so yeah, uh, we partnered with Zoom and uh, we're able to, uh, to really execute on it. So we'll have a couple more VC panels, uh, same as before. Uh, we'll have a couple of people give talks. So uh, a friend of mine, Sean Sheik, um, another one, Ed Lee, who's like 40, Forbes, 40 under 40 and the god of pricing. Um, so the goal is to give you more tools to be able to execute going forward. Cool. If you uh, need anyone for Facebook ads, think of me. <laughs> um, so so then within the scalable uh, system, it, you know, deadline is or when are applications uh, closing? June, June 3rd. 3rd. So we had our first application close two days ago and the final deadline is the third and so uh for those uh people that have either seen about seen scalable heard about scalable um and are about to sign up what should they expect or, or kind of what do you envision happening um during the onboarding process and is it a normal pitch competition or how, how does it go yeah so well it's a little it's a little bit different in that uh instead of like four or five judges i think we have four 40 VC firms and a bunch of the angel groups, like all watching your pitch. So they're going to be going through and giving you specific ratings uh, to see who ends up uh, winning. But the goal is so that is to really help drive deal flow that they might not have seen traditionally uh, to them. So, uh, yeah. Uh, In your last podcast that, that you were on, you talked about the concept of like, you know, you're essentially going from like 
thousands of startups that are applying to hundreds of them that are making it to tens of them to fives of them to eventually a winner. And you kind of got uh, questioned a little bit about, you know, like, how do you make the decisions between X and Y? And you talked a little bit about like, there's some that are just almost there. And mm-hmm. I, and like, I wrote it down in my notes here is like the almost there startup or the almost there entrepreneur. Uh, for a company, you know, like Amplight and for Scalable, what is the differentiator for the ones that are making it to the final rounds and maybe even winning to the ones that are almost there but just didn't quite get it? Probably traction. Um, they might have a product. Uh, uh, I like the uh, like the idea. I like the team. I like where they're at. It might honestly be traction. That could change on this one. Um, I know it was much more apparent for West Coast Challenge uh, in that – you needed some type of revenue because I, I can never validate your idea. Like it's just not, I've seen dumb ideas work. I've seen uh, very great ideas fail. Um, so it's not ever up to me to be able to, to tell what the market actually wants. And so traction is usually the biggest indicator of that for going forward. And so some type of revenue, letters of intent. Um, yeah, I've seen companies that, I don't know of a company right now that I think is absolutely amazing um, that doesn't have revenue yet. So they, I mean, but I think to absolutely be able to execute on it is just three or five, six months away hmm. um, from where we need them to be. But when a founder that you, I mean, when you've seen thousands and thousands of pitches over your career, as you said, you start to get a feel for like, oh, this is a good one. This, they, these people get it. They don't, and, and I'm sure there's a scale. Uh, there's a scale in between, but um, for the ones that you think are a really good idea, you're, you cl- it clicks with you immediately, and then six months later you find yourself being like, oh shit, I don't know if they're going to make it. What what tends to be the problem that the good entrepreneurs with the right ideas, but for whatever reason they can't get that traction? Is there any kind of um, personality traits or things that you see um, that, that kind of uh, unfortunately is against them? Yeah, a lot of time that ends up being just homogenous teams so i've seen like can you explain what yeah, that means sure so i've seen so a homogenous team is like all business students or all engineers or all marketers um all together and so if you don't have differentiation it's very difficult for you to be able to execute so i've seen engineers put together some amazing products and i'm like this will never get to market because none of you can sell uh and so that i think uh is one big detractor that ends up uh one of the more common ones that I see a lot of the time. Do you think that remote teams and sort of this whole new idea that like teams can work remotely is good for the homogenous team, bad for the homogenous team or, or neither? Uh, honestly, I think it's probably better because you can access more talent from different areas to be able to try to execute on it. Um, Knowing that it yeah. solves, knowing that it solves uh, the area around like bringing in new ideas and new culture and, and, and all of that, um, are you a believer in remote teams in general? Uh, when you have startups that come to you and they say, hey, I'm here, but my co-founder is in New York or, or is in Boston or something, um, is, that a, uh, is that a hurdle for you or, or not a no-brainer? No, that's a, uh, to me, it's fine. Um, uh, with the caveat that, and this is when we get back into leadership stuff, like especially as you grow and develop the team, if you have never led someone remotely or you haven't led a team before it will be very difficult to put in the processes in place um, so that you actually can execute going forward so if you have an experienced founder who has leadership abilities then yeah totally fine not a big deal Um, but if you don't it can absolutely lead to disaster Sometimes, uh, you know, in going back to the younger viewer uh, on this podcast that maybe they just say, like, I, I feel like I have the leadership capabilities, but I don't have the experience. I just I, I don't have the experience. Uh, what are the sorts of traits or what are the sorts of things that you equate to really good leadership? Because, uh, you know, it is an ever evolving process. But what do you think makes great leaders? Uh, someone who's a servant leader. So of understanding that uh, it's, so say me as a leader, it's my job to empower my people. So how do I remove barriers from in front of them so that they can reach their true potential? Like, how do I do that? And to me, someone who has that mentality, 
will make an incredible leader because those people will want to run through walls for you. And that's what you need. That's, it's really cool. There, it's not the exact same, but I was reading the book, I think it's 11 Rings by Phil Jackson. And he was talking about, uh, you know, just the Lakers and the Bulls. And he tells this story about how there are these three monks or, or, you know, what have you that are hanging out. And one of them says to the others, like, why is the sun so powerful? And sort of like the master monk or whatever says, the sun gives away all of its energy and power and everything it has to the ground below. And as a result, the trees and the flowers rise towards the sun. And it's kind of like what you're saying around being a service leader. That's oh. um, interesting. I, I like that analogy. That's a really good one. <laughs> Why I want to come back to this idea of like uh, the homogenous team. You talk a lot about like one of the most important things that you can do for yourself is to challenge your own paradigms to um, look at things as not always the way it, it has been done. Why why is it so important to constantly be checking yourself or checking the ones around you? Uh, with the reflection standpoint, I mean, it, yeah, yeah, um, it's how you get better. Uh, Evolving. It, yeah. I mean, it, it, it needs to be constant and you need to take a break, whether it's a day or two, to just uh, kind of digest because if not, you end up getting lost in this hole uh, that we come out of. You're like, oh, I made all these mistakes, but if I just taken a second to breathe, then I would have been able to execute. Um, a lot of times if you don't do that, it's after your ventures already died. Uh, so taking the time to, to take that break and do a lot of the – Mental caring, I think, uh, helps helps a lot. What are you most excited about right now, whether it's in your personal life, business life? Uh, what's kind of, you know, something that, that uh, you're just really passionate about today? Passionate about today. That's so corny. But I'd say my girlfriend right now, but... <laughs> it's great, man. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I'm excited. I got the people in your life, yeah, the important yeah, people Yeah, there we go. Life. Yeah, family, of course. Um, having the ability to spend time with my nephews as they're growing up. They're at seven right now, so it's a great age. Um, having fun with little people just running around. Like, yeah. Lucas, this has been an awesome, awesome episode of Demo Day. We really appreciate you. Where can people find you? Uh, where can they apply to Amplight? Or, or you know, um, how can people get connected with you? Uh, sure. So Lucas J. Poles uh, on Twitter, uh, LJP Photography on Instagram, uh, Amplight.xyz uh, is for uh, investments. I look at cold deals, so I'm always open to it. Um, the application form is on there. Um, and if you click on the tab, scalable application is there as well. Awesome. I'm Sean Goldfan. This is Demo Day. Peace, guys. Entrepreneuring is a lonely profession. Mm. You can find yourself in a bad place. There's a lot of highs, a lot of lows. I take my own advice now. I call or email or contact five new people a day.